and that thank you all for attending. I hope to make this super interactive and I thought um, since this is a relatively uh, topical topic um, for us to look at kind of where the industries are today, what's going on with small businesses and entrepreneurs. I have some interesting data and study information. And of course, we're going to go over um, the general topics covered, um, which are, you know, is your business in good standing, evaluating the intellectual property, uh, is this the right time and will you get the right price for your business and then communicating um, the opportunity to your team, to the market, et cetera. So we're already getting some great questions and I'm going to try to answer questions as we go, but I'm going to talk through my general topics uh, and, and these key points, uh, but then want to look at um, the business and where it stands today and then what you and the opportunities of where to go from here. So one of the things I think that's interesting to think about is how do businesses handle business disruption? And so where are we looking at um, life as we are today um, and considering your options, evaluating temporary closures. So does it need to be a permanent closure, um, formally deciding to close, notifying employees, um, evaluating financial affairs, um, and then what legally needs to be done to make this happen? So at, at a high level, I think we first want to consider whether a full dissolution of your business is the best decision. The current financial reality, as we all know, will eventually change. We may want to have um, a functioning business once the economy bounces back. So you want to make sure that you've explored all the financial resources available to maybe consider paying off expenses for the short term. Um, and to also be aware that some of the money available through government programs has to be repaid. So even if you lay off employees, you have to be careful um, when you're, you're cutting costs, you're closing your business, you may think that then you close your business, these do not have to be repaid, um, and many of them actually do. So you might consider other ways to cut expenses, increase revenue, or adapt your business to the current reality. Uh, completely closing your business may mean that you have to completely liquidate all the business assets and file the paperwork to legally dissolve the company. So after we recover from the pandemic, if you want to continue, you'll eventually then have to start from scratch informing the legal entity again and acquiring the assets. So just thinking through um, what your options look like today, um, I think a lot of people, and funny enough, the questions that are coming in are, I'm ready to close, what do I do? And I always want to say, you know, just be cautious. So one of the things I think about is planning for a temporary um, closure. So something to think about is instead of dissolving your business, you could temporary close your doors, thereby saving on operating expenses until the crisis passes and then open up again uh, to cut expenses uh, during a temporary closure. You could reduce staffing, cut your advertising budget, save on utilities, cancel supply orders. So if your business has signed a lease or other contract with vendors, you might want to talk to those parties. So there's legal things that can be done in terms of negotiating new terms or reduced payments. Um, and in some cases, um, there are some scenarios where there are grounds to break the contract. So just thinking about um, if you decide to temporary close, being sure to update your customers to let them know it might, it's only temporary to stay in contact with your customers and employees. Um, and one of the biggest things that we've seen um, with small businesses is this notion of content online. So really being communicative with social media pages, websites, and online business directory listings, which enables your customers, employees, and others to kind of understand where your business stands today. So even when you're in this, either considering your closure or temporary closure, or being able to communicate in these online capacities. Um, Deluxe, interestingly, has, a, has seen growth in a few areas of business during this time. And one of them is website industry and the opportunity for businesses that are small businesses that create websites websites uh, to be able to communicate with their customers when they otherwise would not. And so we're seeing a ton of growth there. And the mechanism for this is um, social communication with uh, customers and employees. If you formally decide to close, um, you are technically doing what's called dissolving your business. Uh, the next step will then depend on your business structure. So one of the questions that came in was, what if I'm a sole proprietor? What does that involve? And a sole proprietor can actually close up shop without consulting per se. Um, it, there's no formal business structure. Um, and traditionally, if you're a sole prop, you have no one else involved in the business. Um, if, if you're a single only owner, um, you can close the business. It's for your decision as you are the only owner. For LLCs or limited partnerships, you often have to consider your operating agreement to determine the process for closing. And for corporations, you likely need approval of your board of directors. So most businesses should document the formal agreement of drafting a resolution of dissolution in that instance. 
um, which will specif specify the plan for dissolution and the agreement to end the business. What you want to think about is what type of entity you are, and we're going to talk about entity structures in a minute because I've seen a number of questions come in um, about that in the process. So I think it's important for us to think about not just um, closing the business, but what type of structure you are and what that means as a function of closing the business. Then little, you know, uh, uh, ancillary things that aren't necessarily particularly structural relative to your business, but notifying and paying your employees final check, um, wrapping up your financial affairs. So before you can dissolve your business, you have to settle the company's finances. Um, understand that many contracts and financial obligations can be renegotiated, so that may be something you want to think about before you officially close, so you don't have ongoing obligations or liability. Um, it's important, I believe, in business at this time to be open and honest with your customers and contractors. Offer discounts and settlements. Try to figure out an opportunity to save on costs here. So you should consider your financial um, c considerations would include unpaid balances from existing customers, reviewing current contracts, uh, handling outstanding obligations, communicating with current creditors, paying company debt, um, other things, liquidating business assets, and closing bank accounts and credit cards. The question came in about notifying the IRS and I'm from Sandra, and that is also a critical component so that you don't continue to look like you're an ongoing business a a structure. We will talk about more of the um, components of what that looks like, but those are factors that you would want to consider in notifying the IRS of your closure um, is a piece of that because traditionally you have a tax ID associated with that business. And so it's important to think about um, closing the corporate structure, filing the dissolution paperwork, and then notifying the federal government of your closure as well. So for filing a dissolution paperwork with the state, just at a very high level, um, you're looking at dissolving a business. You must file dissolution paperwork with the state. Traditionally, that involves filing a document that specifies the last date of business, the reason for dissolution, a signature, a statement that it was approved by the owners or shareholders. Um, and some states do require you to obtain tax clearance to basically prove that you have satisfied all of your tax debt. So that's another consideration. Um, and during this uh, hour or 50 minutes left, I'm also going to discuss what it might mean to do other things rather than just dissolving the business or closing the business, but thinking about selling the business and what that could look like as a different structure. So in, a dis in addition to dissolution filings, you also have other paperwork to submit to other agencies. So in particular, if your business had uh, licenses or permits, um, we talked about notifying the IRS. You might also consider canceling those permits with the state agencies and, and counties. So that's something that will be on your to-do list. Um, your final tax returns is a consideration uh, with the state and federal agencies. The timing and type of return you file will depend on the type of business you are and the entity type. So it will vary if you are a corporation versus an LLC. Um, but you have to make sure that you're doing your final payroll tax returns, which includes issuing final W-2s to employees and 1099 miscellaneous forms to independent contractors. So those might not be done right at the time of dissolution, but slightly thereafter um, and in tax season. So it's critically important to make sure that all of the W-2s and 1099s are completed. Then thinking about distributing remaining assets, uh, thinking about uh, if any uh, if any assets remain, distributing them among owners. And it's important not to distribute anything until you are sure that all debts and taxes of the business are fully paid. So how you distribute will depend on the type of entity and the number of owners. For LLCs and limited partnerships, distributions will be made according to your operating agreement, which is why early on I said, these are things that you wanna consider um, in the process. I think taking a little bit of a step sideways or, or back is thinking about some, some interesting data that's come out about what businesses are thinking about now and how the economy is looking to small businesses. And a study just came out by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for Small Business, and it talked about the impact of COVID on small businesses and entrepreneurs. And I thought it was particularly important for this conversation as we're all talking together about closing the business, thinking about, do we need to panic um, and close it, cancel the LC, do the filings, file the dissolution, um, or, or or do we sit tight for a moment, um, evaluate next steps, and then think about maybe selling the business as another uh, structure? So across the country, we're noticing that more small business owners are reopening and have cautious optimism. And some data that I um, uncovered during these studies is that small businesses that temporarily closed at some point since the pandemic are more likely to say that they are reopened 
at this time. Um, so 69% in the month of August have said that they reopen versus in May, so just two months ago, um, 43%. So that's a significant jump. 86% of small businesses surveyed reported that they are fully open, 52%, or partially open, 34%. So that's up seven points from the 79% in May. So we're seeing some really significant comeback. Um, there is no question that most small businesses are concerned about the financial hardship. 70% um, show concern, um, and more than half, 58%, think that there could be more to come um, in the, that they're trying to reopen and they may find that they can't find that profit margin um, and may have to permanently close. So there is some concern there, um, but there is definitely less concern um, than businesses were reporting in May. So I think thinking about small businesses pressing forward is a critical component of um, the decision making. And one of the things we're going to talk about in a minute is how do you make a decision and wh when do those decisions happen and when is it time or not. Um, so um, one of the questions that just came in is about temporarily closing versus permanently closing. And the truth is, um, if you're temporary closed, then the, the legal filing part that we're talking about here does not need to be undertaken. The communication, the messaging, the employee com um, communication needs to be expressed, but not necessarily the filings at the state offices or the federal offices. So you wouldn't need to be closing your business licenses or filing dissolution paperwork or filing your final W-2s. Instead, you would be more about notifications to um, either your vendors or your employees, your partners, of course, your customers. And that's when I talked about the website component um, being a very good communication methodology by which you, t you communicate a temporary disclosure without necessarily doing any official legal filings. So as we go back to thinking about returning to normal and other data about small businesses, it's also important to think about half of small businesses believe it will take about six months to a year before the small business climate returns to normal. Very consistent with what we've seen since COVID began, um, and more than half expect next year's revenues to increase over where they are today. So um, that's a significant opportunity um, for where the mind frame of small business owners are, um, and they're more likely to report plans to increase increase investment in the upcoming year. So 35% of small business owners say, we're doubling down at this point, um, and that's up 8% from May. So again, it's only 35%, but it's something to think about that some business owners have put their businesses on pause. Um, they haven't done the formal filings or closures, uh, but they are thinking about um, the opportunity to grow and reinvest in the business. So anyway, I thought some of that data was just important. Um, the notion of hiring is a critical component. More small businesses anticipate increasing staff in the next year, up seven percentage points, 30% over 23 in May. So again, definitely positive trajectory, but something to think about. The numbers still aren't ultra positive. We're not talking 70% are looking to hire, which is where we were last year this time. Uh, and so there is definitely some trepidation, but certainly uh, a lot of businesses may be thinking about a semi-hold or pause rather than full closure. I think about before COVID, um, what, what were the reasons that business owners often looked to sell? And it was liquidation of an equity, um, operation of, of um, operational or strategic purposes, um, conversion of equity to cash, recapitalizing a business, aging out. And today you might be thinking about, I'm gonna sell my business or close it because of change in the economy, um, pandemic, expenses outweigh revenue. And so I think those are often things that we would wanna consider um, as opposed to simply closing a business, there may be this notion of pausing the business and then looking at selling. When you are talking about any type of move from your business, um, meaning you're either selling the business or you are closing the business, um, you want to think about whether your business is currently in good standing. And this is a critical component to any business. Frankly, it's, it's important for ongoing business structures is to maintain good standing. Both you want to minimize potential for liability, you want to protect your personal assets. So the reason you form your business or structure in the first place, a corporation or an LLC, is for the purpose of protecting personal assets, potentially saving taxes, adding legitimacy to your business. These are all factors that if, for example, you do not maintain good standing, all of those are um, basically defunct. In essence, we call this in the law piercing the corporate veil, meaning unless you maintain your corporate structure properly, then you, you really cannot claim this protective veil of your corporation separating your personal assets from those of the business. 
So I, my slide here talks about the business being in good standing, and this would be the case if you closed your business, if you sold your business, you paused your business for a temporary period of time, and frankly, it's critical even if you're running your business from a tax standpoint or a penalty or liability standpoint, you want to make sure that you have all of your um, ducks in a row and I's dotted, T's crossed. So one of the first things we talk about and getting a lot of questions on is have you actually incorporated your business? So it sounds like a lot of um, the, the listeners are sole proprietors and haven't actually formed a corporation or LLC. And when we talk about closing a business, um, there's no formal paperwork that needs to be filed if you're simply a sole proprietor. Um, you're winding up your affairs differently if there's debt, et cetera, um, notifying employees, but there is no formal structure or paperwork. So one of the best things about being a corporation or LLC, as I mentioned, is you're separating your personal assets from those of your business. So for example, if there is liability. If there are creditors, then that doesn't come across to your personal assets. It stays separate and in the business. Especially if you have partners, if someone, if the business is having um, significant financial impact, that impact does not flow to any of the individuals involved in the business, which is why it's critically important to maintain the business in good standing. And what does that mean? It means that you are filing your annual reports with the state. So every state, um, with the exception of a very few, have what's called an annual report filing, um, a statement of information that is filed with the state office to notify the state of who your owners are and your ownership structure, the addresses, the registered agent for your business. It's relatively minimal, the amount of information you're filing, but it's critically important to maintain what's called good standing with the state. So once you form your corporation or LLC, this is often required on an annual basis that you file your statement of information or annual report. Report. It's not uncommon for business owners to forget to do this and to fall into bad standing. In some states, you're forced to pay penalties. So it's really important to make sure that you are in good standing. Every Secretary of State has information. Most of it is online. So you can access your Secretary of State and be able to obtain information on the standing of your business. Even if you think you filed something, it's good to do regular checkups to make sure that the state reporting is what you is consistent with what you have. So making sure that your statement of information has been filed, but also that they've received it and that they've updated the database to show that it's been received, which is a good um, just a good status check for you to make sure that that is the case with your particular business. Um, you also want to make sure that you're filing your taxes and that there is tax compliance. So most secretaries of state will report failure to file taxes um, on in a compliance mechanism. So they'll notify uh, the states that the taxes are not in good standing. And so that's a critical component um, to consider tax filings and your annual report. Another thing to think about, and we talked about if you are closing the business, I'm notifying the proper state agencies or licensing boards that you are no longer in business. But to the extent that you are going to do that, you want to make sure that you're actually in compliance first. Um, so making sure you have proper state IDs. I mentioned when you um, notify employees, for example, that you may be closing or selling a business, you want to make sure that the, the information is set with the state agencies. So for withholding uh, for payroll tax reasons, you want to make sure that those agencies have the proper information. Um, and to the extent that you need business licenses relative to the type of business that you're forming, it's critically important that you maintain current status on that. Some business licenses, many states have an annual reporting update for business licenses as well. Some, it's every five years, uh, but it's important to know what type of industry you are in and what type of business licenses can need to support that type of industry. Then we think about, have you maintained documentation so that you can easily provide the details requested? Those might consider, include things like your bylaws um, associated with your entity, your operating agreement. I talked about minutes, um, so making sure that every year you're updating your, your minute book to reflect what is happening in your entity. It is not a requirement with LLCs. It is a requirement with corporations. So, Talking about your corporate structure is a critical component here, what needs to be done with each type of corporate structure, and that's probably outside the scope of this conversation, but I think it's important for you to know what type of documentation needs to be maintained with each type of entity and making sure that you're maintaining it current. So 
again, when we talk about business licenses and renewal filings, um, your annual report, making sure that you retain that documentation in a place that's safe. Uh, and also that when you go back to have a transaction with your business, whether it's dissolving the company or selling it um, or temporary closing it, that you have an understanding of what that looks like as a part of your bylaws or operating agreement. For business owners, it's a fantastic resource to refer to. Okay, what did we agree to when we formed this entity? What did we agree to do for the entity when something like this happens? It's why when people ask me, should I form a corporation or LLC or should I just run my business as a sole prop or partnership? And I say, you know, often all the benefits that we've talked about, forming a corporation separates your personal from your um, business. It keeps your partnership assets separate from your own, your own personal assets. It prevents uh, creditors or liability employees from coming against you personally. It enables you to have a formal structure for vendors to um, have a formal situation to communicate and, and have a separate structure of business with you. So all of those are very valuable pieces of the puzzle. Um, it also means that you'll need to do an official filing to maintain. And my positioning is that when you form this structure, you're actually establishing um, kind of the boundaries under which you do business. And that may include if you have to dissolve or sell a business. So it's often good to think about these things before a crisis comes and before the issues present themselves. Um, and that's critically important. So I will move on to the next slide and thinking about other things you might consider when you're talking about your business. I actually got a lot of questions in the chat about intellectual property and what part of that is as it relates to your business. So maybe not the physical assets of your business, but how do you evaluate um, what is your intellectual property? And I'll take one step back and say, so what in general is intellectual property? It's often the name and uh, assets of your business that are not physical. So a, a trademark, for example, a word, phrase, symbol, or design, or a combination that distinguishes the source of your goods from those of others. Um, and a lot of people ask, and one of the questions here is, um, is protecting a business name actually different from a trademark? And the answer is yes. So often when you protect your business name, in essence, you are filing at the Secretary of State um, and you are filing with the, the the Secretary of State does not do an evaluation if there's other businesses with that same name out there other than in their jurisdiction, is there an identical business with that corporate indicator? Um, they don't allow two business names exactly the same, but they're not doing an evaluation from a trademark standpoint to give you that intellectual property value or value associated with that independent asset. So the short answer is the business name is just a business name. It's a way to identify a business entity or individual. There is potential value in a trademark, and there's inherent property rights uh, associated with the trademark. So in that instance, trademarks are registered with the federal government through an application process, um, and it's registered with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. That process takes over six months in most cases, and the property rights of trademarks can be enforced both at the federal level and at the state level. So the business name, as I mentioned, is limited to the state. States have differing laws on how different the name can be from the business names within the state. Um, and some states have very loose laws. So for example, Transamerica Airlines Inc. is acceptable even though Trans-America's Airlines um, LLC already exists. Some states are very particular and others are not, but in any event, it's important to know that the states aren't really evaluating um, the trademarkability of the names. They're really just looking at um, is that exact name available. Trademarks on the other hand are property. Similar to other tangible property, the owner of a trademark has the exclusive right to that mark and can prevent other individuals from using the trademark. So it's also not limited to a business name. It can be a phrase, logo, symbol, design, image. Think of Nike, um, the swoosh. There's tons of examples of logos or slogans that are trademarks that are intellectual property and have inherent value in your business that you should consider. So not just considering upon dissolution, but making sure that you have that asset valued um, if you're going to dissolve or sell a business. Um, and making sure that you have that buttoned up in advance um, so that you're not wondering after the fact um, if you actually have the rights into that mark it might create a more difficult scenario for ultimately if you decide um, to sell the business. The trademark cannot tarnish the value of another trademark or blue the, uh, uh, blur the consumer's perception of the trademark with another. So it's important that you know that you have exclusive rights to that mark. Um, and the application can be complicated, but if you have a trademark, a federally registered trademark, there is significant value in that and something that you'd want to consider whether you decide to close the business or sell the assets. 
Um, and again, the best time to file a trademark is really as you're developing and investing in your brand. Um, and so if, if you've already been doing that, that's a critical component. If you haven't, and then you look to sell the business, the buyer may be interested in that intellectual property. Actually, filing for the trademark may be quite valuable, or giving those assets and rights over to a, a potential acquirer or buyer would be valuable. One of the questions that someone asked is, what's the difference between a trademark and a copyright? And I'll just answer really quickly. A copyright's more of an original work of art, a literary, dramatic, music or artistic art, like a novel, movie, or song, um, versus a trademark is a word or phrase or symbol. And again, another question about the difference between a trademark and a patent, and um, a patent is really a, a different type of intellectual property. Um, they include uh, machines, unique processes, unique and useful industrial processes or manufactured items. Um, similarly to a trademark, a patent protects the inventor um, by preventing others from using it. So again, a patent could actually be a very valuable intellectual property asset that can be sold or transferred um, if you're dissolving a business. Um, I'm going to skip over this really quickly and think about whether the timing is right and what, what does your timing look like and what are your steps in deciding on um, what to do with your business. And one of the questions, funny enough, that came in just now was um, a business valuation um, and what that means. And so obtaining a business valuation is a good way for you to assess both the tangible and intangible assets of your business. One of the first things you might want to do is obtain a realistic idea of what your business is worth from an objective outside source. Um, a professional valuation will give you a basis for gauging buyer offers and will give you an idea of what you can expect to net from the sale. One of the things I've been hearing a lot about are um, bigger companies looking to get, quote, assets, valuable assets for cheap. Um, so for small business owners, it might not be that cheap, right? They might make a lot of money um, to the extent that you have um, your, your intellectual property in a row, you have a good business asset, you just might not be seeing the margins you'd like, and a big company could potentially see value in your business. So that may be something that you could think about as a part of this process is getting a business valuation, understanding what the value of the business is, and then looking to sell the business maybe to a strategic acquirer that is interested in your business, um, even when, for example, you may not be able to make it profitable, um, that asset within a larger entity could find value or more value you than it would be as a standalone. So thinking about the business valuation is a big piece of that. It tells you the business market position, often the financial situation. Frankly, it's an independent value of the strengths and weaknesses of your business. Um, they can also be obtained from a number of resources, local accounting firms, regional business brokers, um, even investment banking firms. So as a rule, um, you should make sure that the company performing your valuation has access to the most current national data um, and experience in understanding what your industry looks like. Um, Again, if your business is doing well, you can you might consider a, a higher asking price. You have to obviously consider the current market situation um, and 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 buyers. So it, this may be a step in the direction of of closing. You may think, well, let me see if there's potential buyers available before you just close the business, and that could be something that would be um, one of the things that you'd want to do. Um, and so, so again, looking at the business valuation and your process of selling um, your, your business is a critical component. Um, and, and again, considering your intellectual property is a big piece. Other things to think about as we go down this kind of is the timing right and are you ready analysis, getting your books in order. Buyers evaluating your business want to look at often three years of financial information. For many small businesses, you might not have uh, a ton of financial data and details. Um, and a lot of times, even buyers will ask for audited financials. Uh, in many cases, this is not necessarily a requirement, um, but tax returns may suffice. I think the biggest piece of the puzzle here is really making sure that you're separating your personal expenses from those of your business. I recognize as a business owner that many business owners at one time or another run personal expenses to their business. Um, this can be confusing for buyers um, and frankly, even hard for you to get an assessment of the value of the business and the revenue associated with the business. So when you're ready to sell, it's important that you don't, don't do this or separate it out for a moment um, to really understand um, what, what the accurate picture of the revenue expenses and net profits of your business are, both in, in terms of a reality check for you personally, but also uh, as you look at potential buyers and what they might be interested in understanding. Um, this also relates to the next point about understanding the profit margins on your business. If you can't see the true profit margins because you're so intertwining your personal with the business, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to see. So 
Um, most privately held businesses claim a variety of non-operational expenses um, and make sure you're documenting those expenses. Um, for example, a personal automobile lease would be an expense to a business, but if it, there were an independent buyer, um, then that would not be necessarily an expense on a go forward basis. So it's important to think about what that really looks like uh, and, and evaluating the true profit margin of your business. I talked earlier about consulting a financial advisor. This is very useful when you're talking about a business valuation, but you might just want to speak to your tax advisor on helping you plan your financial future. What makes sense if you were to close the business? What makes sense if you were to sell the business? So understanding your personal and corporate tax situation might also help you recognize options, um, both with regard to a potential deal structure, but also with regard to maybe dissolving the business or closing it, even shutting it temporarily. What does that look like? Um, maintaining a connection with your financial advisor is really important. I just find it also to be a good level set. Someone independently looking at what the revenue looks like, what your expenses look like, what the potential for the future is, having a third party who's um, a disinterested third party is a critical component. So, and that's separate um, from what you might see in terms of a business valuation. Certainly a financial advisor could be involved in that, um, but a financial advisor really is someone who's looking at you over the life cycle of your business and understanding trajectory and where your business is headed. Um, and I think I, I put make, making a good, be prepared, knowing your business. If you're looking at selling or, or you're looking at closing or you're looking at an acquirer, um, you want to make sure you understand your business, your reason for selling, um, anticipate detailed questions. So these are all things you want to have in place. I also think it's really a, a big piece of the puzzle to have a good advisory team. It doesn't need to be expensive lawyers and accountants, but certainly people who understand your business and your industry and are able to give you feedback. Um, and then I think one of the things you don't want to forget about is keeping your eye on the ball. If, if you're not looking at dissolving or closing the business, um, you don't want to lose all your customers. You don't want to forget about the potential here of, of reopening or growing the business. So nothing is certain when you're thinking about which strategy to go in. I'm thinking about dissolving. I'm thinking about temporary closing, or I'm thinking about an inquirer selling the business. You just want to make sure you're not completely disregarding the potential for your business to grow, um, for you to identify opportunity areas during this process, and to frankly maybe not be able to sell the business and ultimately decide, so where do you go from here? So I talk about keeping your eye on the ball. Do not lose focus on your business altogether while you're thinking about this process. Um, and when we talk about, I kind of mentioned this at a high level, fully understanding your business assets, but we talked about tangible assets and intangible assets. Think about land, cash, investments, buildings, frankly, inventory. And then again, we talked about intangible assets such as patents, copyrights, trademarks. Think about the goodwill of the business. That's sort of why I go back to the point about not losing sight of your business, right? What's important is often the goodwill is your employees, your customers, um, the relationships that you've built. So if you go all one direction, all in, I'm selling, that's it, I'm giving up, I'm throwing in the towel, and you take that approach, that goodwill may actually be lost really quickly. Uh, customers and employees observe that fast. And so when you're thinking of selling or um, or trying to find a seamless way out or to sustain until you sell, you want to make sure you don't lose sight of um, what, what your current business is and the revenue that you're making in order to make it um, either less financially painful if you were, dis if you were um, dissolving or to optimize the opportunity if you're ending up deciding to sell the business. So um, depending on whether you're, you're looking at um, understanding just the whole overall financial condition of the business, considering your balance sheet, looking at your P&L. And, and, and again, you want to look at the P&L uh, profit and loss statement, not just in the last six months where it's been all over the place and things have been very different. You might see, frankly, a lot of businesses are seeing greater margins uh, during COVID because they've cut a lot of their expenses. They're not marketing. They have fewer expenses for employees. Um, maybe they've cut some vendor opportunities. So what's happening is maybe there's opportunities for margin optimization, but you're seeing decrease in growth um, which may be fine. That might be actually more interesting from a potential acquirer or buyer. So looking at what your P&L looks like, not just in the last six months, but over the last few years, uh, and evaluating that, putting your best foot forward there. Also reviewing your tax returns um, and financial statements. Um, and then thinking about just your business debts. Are there any liens? Um, consider your bank statements. So thinking about just making sure that you have a complete picture of what your business looks like today. Um, and understanding that is critically important. And then I wanted to share some information about if you are going to sell the business, um, there's 
often what's called a letter of intent. So you might have opportunity from potential buyers um, to look at what's called a letter of intent, which basically explains the terms of a deal. So one of the things that's very common in this process is looking at um, what a potential buyer would be interested in paying and what that overall looks like. Often a letter of intent is non-binding, and that's a step in the process before you get to this piece, which is the slide that talks about drafting a sales agreement. So I think it's important here that if you're interested in selling the business, um, whatever your catalyst for selling, uh, it's crucial to hire your necessary team in the event that you have a potential buyer that's interested. It's important that you look at this team as helping you identify identify the value of the business. We talked about the valuation, both your um, tangible assets and your intangible assets, but also looking at um, what, whether the timing is right, um, the whole process around notifying your vendors, your employees, et cetera, and also just overall the valuation, understanding the terms of the deal um, and making sure that there's no ambiguities in the process. So those are important considerations when you're talking about um, managing the business. Then we talk about, I say here, managing the business post sale, but really it's at any event, if you're closing the business or you're taking time to dissolve the business, um, thinking about what your involvement is, if you sell it, um, are you expected to stay on after the sale and for how long? So all of those are ideas and areas that you want to consider in the process of either dissolving or selling a business, um, making sure that you have all the documentation and expertise. We talked about um, making sure that your business is in good standing, that you have all of the documentation filed, that it's all organized in a particular fashion. This would be the case if you had a potential acquirer. They would want all of this information, but they would, you would also need it in the event that you are closing the business or dissolving it by filing um, the business uh, documentation at the state level. You also want to spell out your role of employees. I think one of the most important things, and we talked about this really a bit earlier on, was communicating with employees, both um, what the ongoing trajectory of the business is going to be, what your anticipated time, if you're closing the business, what your expectations are about communication, um, if those employees would be valuable to you in other roles in the future, um, or frankly, if, if the business is um, sold, would those employees go with the business or would they stay on? Um, or would you use them or work with them in some future capacity? So those are all considerations that would be taken in for management of the business uh, post sale. I know I'm at my 140 time and I promise to answer questions and I think we have about 75 some questions I have yet to answer. Um, so maybe we take a pause and go through some of those questions um, in the next 15 minutes, um, if that makes sense. Alexa, should we okay. go through those? <laughs> Sure, Deborah. Sounds good. Let's go ahead. We'll transition into the Q&A segment. We have been receiving a lot of really great questions. We'll do our best to address just as many as possible in this time remaining. So let's jump right on in here. Deborah, the first question, this comes to us from Susan. And Susan is asking if you can talk a little bit about how you place a value on non-inventory parts of the company for example, company logo, overall artwork, artists and products designs, years of active business, uniqueness of small community that is services. Can you that, speak to that yep. a little bit? That's a great question. I think all of those are categorized in what we had called earlier your intellectual property. And it's interesting to say, um, to think about intellectual property, we think often about it being trademarks and copyrights and patents, but also there is assets such as trade secrets, right? I think that's sort of what you were mentioning on um, like the content of your website and, and also just the technology assets that may not be inventory per se. Um, and there are valuations that can be uh, done as it relates to that those types of assets. So when I mentioned having independent valuations done of your business is valuable, you can also look at um, do searches online for competitive sales or competitive businesses if they have sold in similar industries. Um, and, and I think it's important if you are selling your business to make sure that those are all documented. A lot of times business acquirers may see only what they see in a very formalized structure, like your trademarks, copyrights, the very formal um, intellectual property, but there may be value in intangible assets such as um, your website, um, your social media opportunities, which is a very valuable asset, the number of customers you work with, um, you mentioned um, in the question, the history of time in the business. So again, you can hire an independent value uh, 
business to do evaluation, or you can do research online to look for whether there's other companies similarly situated that have sold um, to other acquirers and what that looks like. Um, it is not a perfect science, but I do think it's important for you as a business owner to categorize what those are and provide an estimate or valuation to the extent that it's not a professional one. What does that valuation look like to you as an individual? For example, um, you have a fantastic presence online um, and that converts to X hundred thousand dollars in sales because people are finding you online. So those are ways to think about valuing um, different assets of your business and where those um, may be not traditionally presented, but a critical compar uh, component of selling your business. Great question. Okay, Deborah, this next question comes to us from Andre, and Andre says that one of his clients opened an LLC and requested an EIN from the IRS. However, with COVID situation, they decided to close the company even before starting operations or mm -hmm. hiring people. So what Andre is asking is, do they still have to file a final tax return if there was zero movement in the company and they didn't even open a bank account? Yep, that's a great question. Um, no, often the case is no. And in, in most states, it depends on the amount of time that lapsed between forming the entity and closing it. So um, it, you have to look up your specific state rules. And often, at least at the IRS level, it's simply a letter to the IRS on company letterhead that says, I did not actually transact any business under this tax ID, please close it, and that will be done. Um, as it relates to the formation of the LLC at the Secretary of State level, a lot of that depends on timing. You can file relatively simple, what's called a zero return, um, and that's a single page filing. It's not a significant tax return filing, um, and you just call it um, no income declared. So if even if you've passed the time frame to just dissolve and not do a filing at all, then filing a zero return is a relatively simple way to, um, to culminate the closure of the business. So uh, you, you have to do a quick search on your individual uh, state rule, and you can understand what that looks like. So you'd want to look both at um, the entity filing if you're dissolving the entity formally at the corporate level. Um, and frankly, the, the state will tell you, oh, you, you're within the time frame, no problem. Um, it's just this one piece of paper. Um, if not, you're outside the time frame, then you need to file your tax documentation and get a certificate of good standing at which time you can dissolve. Uh, and then you would send a letter to the IRS, um, which is literally a, a handwritten letter um, that says, please close, this is my tax ID. So I think those are relatively simple steps. It's just a matter of identifying the specific rules in your own state. And traditionally, to come full circle, contacting the state office and just asking that quick question, am I within the time frame?" is a good first step. Hope that helps. Okay, next question is from Kathleen. Asking if there is a special form or procedure that must be done to close payroll and sales tax with the state so notices are not received for non-filing after being closed. Yes. And you yes, there is. What mark final um, on the last return, is that sufficient? Some states will allow you to um, do final on your last return, but it's more common and, and, and they'll keep contacting you, I think, was part of the question. You want to avoid that. So if you have a withholding ID or a state unemployment insurance ID, which I think is what you're mentioning relative to the payroll taxes, it's really smart to just send in um, the official closure documentation. It's a simple, um, a relatively simple, if you contact the state office for withholdings or state unemployment office, um, you can get that final documentation to file just to make sure that it's closed. Most state offices, interestingly, will sort of let you go into um, just a, a um, inactive status. Uh, but there are many that will just keep contacting you, and I find that it's better um, to officially dissolve, officially close out um, with a proper notice. It can be extra and, and a bit time-consuming, and you just want to be done, um, but I think it's important that you take that step, especially if you've been contacted or there's been outreach, um, to ensure that it's closed. It's good not to leave open state accounts if you can avoid it. All right, next question comes to us from Elaine, asking if you need a lawyer to dissolve an LLC that has already sold all of its assets. 
No, no. Um, actually, you can do a simple online dissolution filing. So all states have access to that. Um, I'm not um, promoting any particular online company, but an online service agency can do the simple filing. It's really a transaction with the state and just sort of knowing what documents to file. But it's, it's traditionally called an LLC dissolution. Um, if you happen to be what's called foreign qualified in the state, so for example, um, your home state is um, California and you're qualified to do business in New York uh, and you no longer have employees in New York or you've dissolved in that entity, then you file what's called a withdrawal in a foreign qualified state. But traditionally, the filing name is called an LLC dissolution. Uh, and if that's if you are in your home state and it's the state in which you're filing. And you do not need a lawyer to do that. There's no legal requirement that a lawyer file it for you. It's usually a one to two page transactional document. And again, um, you'll need potentially a certificate of good standing. So in order for the business to be dissolved, kind of as I mentioned really early on in this discussion, you'll need to prove that you've paid your taxes and that you are in good standing. So you'll wanna make sure that that is the case um, before you do the filing, because you might then have to circle back and prove that you are in good standing and that can be a little bit of a headache. It sounds like if you've already sold all the assets and that is the case, then it's just a simple dissolution filing. Okay, Deborah, this next question comes to us from Richard, asking if you temporarily close, what does this mean for the employees? For example, if they want to file for unemployment, would they be able to, and would you have to notify them of the temporary closure? Yes, so it is very common, and we're seeing a lot of temporary closures occurring where the owners notify the employees, and, and to your point, the employees are able to claim unemployment and even, frankly, um, back unemployment to the time that they may have been put on pause from working. And many have seen or experienced the additional funds from the federal government that they've been receiving um, for that unemployment. So to answer your question, um, yes, notifying employees is important. Um, I believe just from a process procedural standpoint, it's very wise to notify employees, vendors, and your customers, um, and to be upfront about that piece of the puzzle. And frankly, it's really smart business because then you'll be able to communicate um, when you anticipate returning in the same fashion that you, you communicate the closure, um, but it does then enable your employees to be officially on unemployment with the state. Great question. All right, next question. This comes to us from Angela. Angela is asking if you port part of your business to a new location, for example, closing a physical restaurant, but keeping the ghost kitchen. Would it be cleaner yeah. to dissolve the entity and start a new one or keep the entity whole? Yeah, love it, love it. So I think the considerations I would think about in porting a business from one type of structure to another, um, I wouldn't worry so much about if your original description um, when you filed for the entity was restaurant and now you're more of a catering service, for example, um, rather than an in-person restaurant. Um, the state's not going to concern itself with your business description um, as an entity. If you continue to do business in general under the same overall structure as you had before, then there is no need to dissolve or close the original business and then form a new entity um, necessarily. There would be some considerations where you might want to think about doing that. That would include different owners. So if you have entirely different owners and you have a certain LLC that has a membership agreement or um, bylaws, or sorry, operating agreements under the LLC that suggests that there's a certain methodology by which you're closing the business or distributing profits um, or assets, uh, assessing debt or loans or liens, uh, you might want to go through that full process with those owners to the extent that your new business has different owners and a different structure, then that could be cleaner in some instances. But to the extent that there are the same owners and the same general uh, business structure, then you may just file, um, you know, an update to your operating agreement or, or, or um, update your operating agreement, it doesn't have to be filed, and maintain the same corporate structure. There's no requirement that just changing the type of business to the extent that it's relatively similar. And one interesting thing to know is we find um, in our industry that most business owners say um, they file for general business purpose. So the description of the business when you're doing the filing is not so specific that you couldn't kind of alter or shift the way in which you're doing your business um, to make an adjustment in that way. All right, so, next question. Yep. 
this comes to us from Tom. Tom's asking if a corporation is permanently closing, what paperwork needs to be retained and for how long? For example, bank statements, payroll documents, et cetera. There is sort of the traditional federal notion of documentation being saved for approximately seven years. Um, I don't know, to be honest, if there is um, a specific law that says it must be maintained for X amount of time, certainly to the extent that there's debt or liabilities, there's potential outstanding litigation or issues in that regard, then it is something that you would want to consider to maintain. Um, I believe that it's important to consider um, the, the fact that you can scan all the documentation electronically and just maintain it in an electronic file. I, that is very acceptable in most, both in litigation, discovery, and disclosures um, for the IRS. Uh, traditionally, electronic scanning is, is um, considered very effective. So a lot of people, it's more of a physical, do I have to literally maintain papers? Um, and that is not the case um, so much anymore. So I think it's important to think about both, um, is, is it the paperwork, the physical paper that you're worried about, or are you wanting to get rid of everything um, and, and um, maybe not have it be continuing in existence, um, then that would be a separate consideration. But I guess to your point, um, if it's, it's literally what's the law, um, I think there are some that say five to seven years is about right. Um, but I believe that if you scan your documents and they're electronic, then having them in perpetuity is, is smart. Even from a business standpoint, okay. thinking about looking back at your business, um, what was the trajectory? Like you're, maybe you're going to open a new business and you want to refresh your memory. What happened with this business? What was it? What were the financials? What did it look like? It's always good to keep, you know, your paperwork from historic documentation. Sorry to add on. Okay. And then the next question from ACAT is asking, what if there are some gaps in the record keeping, uh, like failure to have minutes for a corporate meeting a few years ago? ACAT wants to know if this is correctable, can they regenerate or yes. backfill records? It's not fatal. It's not there, it, there, it's not fatal. You can make it up. Yep. I mean, I would just go back. I mean, make it up sounds very dismissive, um, but you, you can go back and update documentation to the extent that you need to. Um, it, it's, it's always wise to do your best to maintain it on a regular basis. And certainly if you're a publicly traded company, it's critically important. Um, most of us are all small businesses, sole props or small um, entrepreneurial businesses, and that happens. So it's not crazy uncommon. There are very often gaps. I've seen many businesses where they're sold and they have to prove that they've maintained their minutes and they just can't find them. Um, they disclose that. It's usually, it's never I've never seen it be fatal to a business to, to have a gap in a, in a minutes or, or um, in some sort of filing. Frankly, even if it's a tax filing, you just go back and make that filing, um, correct it, you'll get a certificate of good standing, you're back in business, for lack of a better term. Um, so uh, I wouldn't panic if you can't find some paperwork. Um, and usually you can disclose that and or um, create updates to the documentation at the time that it's discovered. Okay, next question here. Deborah comes from TS, letting us know a potential buying party. They said they'd be willing to sign an NDA, but mm -hmm. they live in a small town. They prefer to keep the potential transfer as quiet as possible. Can you talk about this issue a little bit? Yes, it's super common. An NDA is critically important, both in terms of the disclosure of the information that you're providing, as well as um, just confidentiality between the businesses if you're looking to, to sell it. I'm with you on if you're in a small city and you don't want other people to know, then I think that's that's within the purview of an NDA, but it's also something that you want to just make sure that your actual disclosures are to a limited group of people. Um, because an NDA will cover that, but then do you really want to litigate under an NDA? And so I think just limiting your disclosures is a better outcome. Certainly always have an NDA in place. Um, and for those who don't know, an NDA is called a non-disclosure agreement. But my point is, um, in any event, you still want to limit the disclosures of the information to the extent that uh, you just don't want people to be aware. I, I had a similar incident when I um, sold my business. I didn't want anyone in the industry to know. I hired a counsel that was outside of, of my town, um, and I'm a lawyer, so I knew a lot of lawyers, and it wasn't an easy thing, but I, I really was very similar, so I think I can understand why you would want to not have it become a public thing. Um, and so an NDA helps with you and the transactional parties involved, but maybe not with outside people just discovering that you are selling the business as a, as a matter of fact. And in that instance, um, just be cautious on who you disclose to. 
it can be exciting and something that everybody wants to talk about, but it's also if you don't want it to become a public thing before it's public, it's, it's good to be sure you limit that. Good question. All right. Okay, next question here is from Kathy asking, once the decision to close has been made, can and should the filings be done prior to final tax returns? Traditionally, yes. Um, and you can you can do it all at the same time. There are instances where the final dissolution will require your final tax return documentation, and then you will submit the final dissolution. So um, traditionally, there's um, some overlap with that, both the filings uh, at the same time. So, I mean, literally, it's not the same day, but there are states that will require documentation supporting the final tax return payment made, and then the dissolution will go through. So you'll, you could potentially file your dissolution paperwork, file your tax returns, and the state will hold the dissolution certification until they have your tax documents submitted. Okay, Deborah, we've had quite a few questions come in regarding the the business valuation. Wanting uh -huh. to know who do you go to, who assists you with this, and what's a typical cost to have this done? I have done samples. It's funny. I've investigated a similar, like, what, what's, what's an easy, easy way? And there's a few where you pay a couple hundred dollars, you give your general information, you talk about your industry, you share all sorts of data, and it's more of an automated valuation that comes back. It's, it's not, um, it's valuable just for perspective, but it's not necessarily a documentation upon which you would sell your business. Um, but it is a good starting point. So for someone who wants to just kind of have a sense and then the next level up would be a financial advisor, someone who has valuation experience. Um, the next level up from that might be an investment banker, a venture capital type business owner, um, someone with experience in venture capital that would have an understanding of your industry. So you're looking at people and experts, whether it's a lawyer, um, CPA, financial advisor that would have kind of an understanding of your industry to give you a sense. You can cut some of the costs associated with that if you're looking at a professional business valuation versus the one that I described kind of an online um, plop in some of your, your business data. But you can help by really thinking about yourself, all of the assets um, that are associated with your business. Someone earlier talked about um, things like your website and, and your uh, social media and the, vo the value of each con um, customer and your vendors. So those are all pieces of the puzzle that can help put, pull together what evaluation would look like. Um, and so to the extent that you have that buttoned up and you're communicating that, then you can more easily um, get information about the value of those as it relates to your business and that overall business valuation. So I guess what I'm saying is you can do a very inexpensive online version. You can spend more money with a, a professional financial advisor, but to the extent that you are spending more money, um, do a lot of the legwork yourself, um, have everything prepared, um, know your business better than they do to start with, and then they can help you think through that valuation. Okay, so those are all the questions that we'll have time for today during this live webinar session. If we did not have a chance, to address your question during this live webinar, I'd like to recommend reaching out to your SCORE mentor after today's session who can assist you with your questions and further business needs. If you're not already working with a SCORE mentor, you can get further information by going to the SCORE website. It's www.score.org forward slash find dash mentor. And I'd like to remind you all that we will be sending out a link to the recording of this session as well as the slide deck. And the slide deck does contain Deborah's contact information. You'll have that handy. You can reach out for getting questions answered or for further assistance as well. So on behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all so much for attending today. And I'd like to give a very special thanks to Deluxe Corporation for sponsoring this session and to Deborah Sweeney for presenting with us again. Deborah, thank you so much. We are so grateful for your time and this excellent presentation today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the great questions too, everybody. Well, we hope that you can sign up and join us for a future SCORE Live webinar. You can check those out by going to www.score.org 
forward slash live dash webinar if you'd like to register. And you can also check out the webinars, the recorded webinars that are online and available for you to access anytime at your convenience as well. But thanks again, everyone. Take good care, and we look forward to seeing you back next time.